Today we are joined by Leslie, who is the Senior Coordinator of Foodshare Toronto. So thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us, Leslie. How are you doing today? Doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here. So do you believe that there are any um, structures in today's time that keep on enabling food insecurity, despite all of these progresses and changes towards dismantling that system? Can you repeat that question, please? Um, so do you think that there are any systems that operate within today's world um, that keep on enabling food insecurity? despite all of these organizations and all of these um, push for changes. So do you think it's just the government that is withholding change well, from happening? So, so, so you, you're curious as to how food insecurity is being enabled through current structures? Yes. Okay, so I think, I think in, in order to, to think about how food insecurity is being enabled, enabled by current structures, it's important to understand how we got to this place in the first place and, and to think about kind of where the roots of the current landscape in, of food insecurity in Canada began. Um, and to do that, I think that we need to kind of go back to like the late 1970s. I mean, food insecurity in Canada was an issue far before then, but our, our current response to food insecurity, um, uh, I think can be traced back to the late 1970s when you um, saw a lot of social security benefits Mm -hmm. um, being cut back for mm -hmm. folks. Um, and as a result of the kind of weakening of the social safety net in the 70s and early 80s, then this increased the need for relief for folks. And so to respond to this, the Canadian government began a food banking system in Canada in the early 80s as what was supposed to be a temporary emergency response mm -hmm. um, to, 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 to this issue. And the problem is that this temporary system has grown and proliferated over the years uh, into something that is uh, no longer really looks very temporary at all. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the problem here is that unfortunately, although food banks put food in people's pantry for the day, they do not address the underlying roots of food insecurity, the things that are causing people to, to be food insecure in the first place. And so in addition to that, we've also kind of seen over time uh, a slow erosion of sectors that provide stable non-contract jobs with benefits, um, a loss of things like union jobs and, and a rise of things like temporary employment sectors and, and temp labor companies that often aggressively recruit from low income communities. And so you're seeing this kind of reduction in people's income stability. Um, combined with also a reduction in the, in the social safety net and, and f uh, framing food banking and pouring money into food banking as the solution to this has allowed the government to then look away from the problem of poverty in Canada, mm -hmm. because that's really the root of the issue. The issue was not hunger, the issue was poverty. And so uh, in looking away from the issue of poverty, the government has basically left responsibility for dealing with this issue on communities and on community organizations, mm -hmm. um, which are now sort of struggling to try to fill that gap through things like food provision programs and, and, and other sort of community support programs, when in fact, the government of Canada has the responsibility to uphold the right for food uh, for all Canadians. Mm -hmm. um, and so in turning this issue into an issue of hunger and not an issue of poverty, um, this is why we find ourselves in the current situation and, and this is why we have not solved hunger in Canada because we haven't solved the underlying piece, which is poverty. Mm -hmm. That's very insightful. Let's talk a little bit more about food insecurity on a personal scale. What are the effects of experiencing food insecurity as a person? What effects does it have in the short term? So... <sighs> There are lots of impacts of food insecurity on, on, on people. And, and uh, one of the first things I think that we, we see is that the detrimental impacts of, of food insecurity impact both adults and children. Mm -hmm. um, with food insecure children, you tend to see things like poor learning outcomes in school. Hungry kids uh, don't concentrate very well at school, understandably. Um, 
this also impacts things like childhood development. And you also see that um, kids who experience food insecurity tend to have a greater uh, difficulty recovering when they get sick. Um, uh, if we shift to look at adults, we see similar issues with staying healthy, issues with recovering when you get sick, um, both mentally and physically, as well as kind of a higher overall um, healthcare costs and, and, and higher overall mortality rates. Um, do you have any long-term effects that you would like to highlight to add on to that? Sure. I mean, the long-term effects, I think, really become clear when you begin to look at things like the healthcare costs hmm. of food insecurity, because um, uh, chronic hunger over time means that folks tend to um, uh, be more vulnerable to illness, um, uh, have more touches with the healthcare system, and um, it, it also increases the risk of other long-term health conditions such as asthma and depression. So um, there is a direct correlation uh, between kind of healthcare costs and, and also um, food insecurity status for folks. And I'm sure that's become an even bigger problem now with COVID and the pandemic going on. Absolutely, and I mean, I, I certainly, wouldn't for a second frame this as an issue that, that has anything to do with the people who are food insecure. Um, I think that the important thing to focus on here is that um, what this means is that if we are able to address the roots of food insecurity and eradicate food insecurity, you then are able to significantly reduce the, the cost to the healthcare system as well. Um, so yeah, there, there are lots of benefits to be had there. So that's sort of an economic and national almost um, effect to ending food insecurity. What are the effects of food insecurity, not only to individuals, but communities? Um, yeah, so I mean, the effect of widespread issues like food insecurity are absolutely felt at a community level. Um, I think that communities uh, that, that, that kind of face food insecurity um, as a regular condition, I mean, tend to be communities that are underserved in a myriad of other ways as well. Um, and so when you have in, like pockets of communities that are, are not being served by that social safety net and also um, having lots of folks with uh, facing barriers to access the food that they need, then it, it really makes it challenging for communities to, to have what they need to thrive and to capitalize on the incredible leadership and brilliance that exists within those communities if bellies aren't full and if, if people don't have the money in their bank accounts to both pay rent in a city as expensive as Toronto and also put food on the tables for their families. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it really does have long-term impacts um, and, and forces people to make really difficult decisions that they really shouldn't have to make. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. As you said before, food insecurity should not be a problem that must be taken on by small communities. It must be taken on by the government. Mm -hmm. So what, in what ways are the government trying to fix or instill programs that solve food insecurity? Um, so, I mean, I guess my response to that is that the, the government is not currently solving food insecurity. Um, the, the response of, of the government, is, I think also if we look at um, what's taken place since the pandemic hit in terms of the response to the pandemic, um, and, and I mean, we've seen lots and lots of money flowing directly to the food banking system in Canada as a direct response. Um, and although I will absolutely acknowledge that it's important for folks who don't have food at home to have food in their pantries, then I, I still think that, that it's important for us not to be distracted from the government's longer term responsibility to uphold the right to food. And, and, and that comes from um, the 
um, a, a document that was uh, ratified in Canada in 1976 called the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. And um, this document basically um, enshrined the right to food for all Canadians. And, and what that meant was that the government was not committing to handing out free food or, or, or to delivering food door to door for all Canadians. They, they, they were committing to creating the conditions in Canada under which everyone could access the money that they need for food and, and the food that they need to, to, to be healthy. Um, and so uh, in doing things like weakening the social safety net and, and reducing unemployment benefits or disability payments, that sort of thing, then the government is actually also ignoring its responsibility to uphold the right to food um, because all of these things are connected to people's income. Mm -hmm. Do you have any ways or would you like to speak to the government about other ways that they can be helping communities um, eradicate food insecurity? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think we really need to reframe the entire conversation about food insecurity in Canada to move away from talking about hunger and mm -hmm. to move toward talking about poverty. Because if we are able to solve poverty, then we will also manage to solve food insecurity. Um, uh, and so to do that, then it requires a focus on income-based solutions. And there are many levers that the government could pull in order to, to move us in that direction. Um, I mean, things like a universal basic income, um, things like um, mandating minimum wages to be tied to a living wage in Canada that is, that is pegged to something like inflation that increases as inflation happens over time. Um, there have also been conversations about things like reparations um, that, that have been gaining traction recently to, to address the historical legacy of trauma and, and oppression in, in, in the Black community. Um, and, and I mean, there are also other, other creative solutions like um, the government committing to providing a basket of goods, a basket of subsidized goods, and, and potentially also services um, to folks uh, so that they can um, know that perhaps they have access to this basket of goods that's really cheap and, and also access to, say, subsidized um, medical, dental, pharmacare, that sort of thing, so that like, basic needs for folks are taken care of. And this is all, uh, these are all pieces that the, that, that the government is able, is, is far more effective in addressing than community organizations like ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And aside from eradicating food insecurity as being the moral and human thing to do, how will a future without food insecurity help our own economy? So, I mean, I think the, the, the first thing that comes to mind there is that um, in, in driving down the healthcare costs, that we now pay because of um, the, the um, fact that uh, we haven't taken the steps to, to adequately address things like poverty and food insecurity. Um, the, the additional healthcare costs that are incurred um, as a result of that would disappear um, if, 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 if we are able to, to, to create a future without food insecurity. Um, additionally, I mean, what we've essentially done through our approach to food insecurity is to, is to criminalize poverty and food insecurity. Mm -hmm. um, and and in, in, in so doing, then people are forced to do things that they perhaps wouldn't otherwise do. Um, I mean, we need, we need an approach to health, for example, that moves beyond uh, a sick care system. We need to think about not just how to respond when people get sick, but how to create the system of supports that prevent people from getting sick in the first place. Because again, I mean, if you look at studies and, and crunch the numbers, then preventing people from getting sick is a lot cheaper than treating people after they're already sick. Um, Additionally, uh, in addition to things like uh, decreased healthcare spendings, then um, those funds can also be, be, be used to support initiatives that actually keep people healthy. Um, and, then, and then lastly, I think that um, a future where 
poverty is, is, is being addressed adequately in society it would be a future without food insecurity. And uh, in that future, I also think that it's important to note that we can't do things like let uh, Canada's billionaires off the hook, for example, in paying their taxes and, and, and large corporations, many of which um, are able to take advantage of, of tax loopholes to, to remove tons from our our tax coffers. So all of these sorts of things are able to help. Uh, if, if we're able to close these loops, um, then, then, then we, we should be able to, to have enough money to, to create that system that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And how does, how does this ideal future without food insecurity, without poverty, how does that tie into what is going on with the BLM movement? I mean, I think it has to do with thinking about the different barriers that different groups face. Um, I think that the Black Lives Matter movement and, and this current conversation has arisen in recognition of the fact that Black communities have historically not had equal access to the resources um, that were enjoyed by white and other communities. Um, and that the, the, their priorities and initiatives have, have the, the priorities and initiatives of the black community have not been seen as all of our priorities and initiatives. Um, and I think that uh, the work that we do at Future and, and, and also kind of this, this recent rise of, the com of, of, of centering that more in the conversation is in service of trying to move toward a world where like black issues are not just black issues, black issues are everybody's issues. Mm -hmm. um, indigenous issues, again, are not just issues for the indigenous community, they're, is they're issues for all of us. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, as, as, I, as I think about this, 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 this future world that you talk about without food and security, um, then it's, it's a world in which kind of programming and systems are designed such that they are responsive to the needs of a much wider swath of our community. Um, uh, black communities, indigenous communities, queer and trans communities. I mean, uh, I, you, you could go on and on uh, listing the communities that kind of have been left out of the conversation um, historically and, and, and who deserve a seat at the table because uh, there is incredible power and leadership and insight and innovation that uh, is, is being ignored and, and has historically been ignored uh, taking place in these communities and, and it's time for that to change. So before we wrap up, let's go back to Food Share. Um, we talked a little bit about the work that Food Share does and its mission and all of the different teams that operate within it. Um, so what is Food Share doing um, to specifically create long lasting change within communities? Uh, yeah, and um, I think that long lasting change is exactly where we need to be focused in this mm -hmm. conversation. Um, and I, I guess before, before I answer that, I, I would circle back again to the point that programs like ours will not ensure long lasting change. Our advocacy work pushing the government to uphold its responsibilities is what we feel is really going to move the needle on that long lasting change for, for communities. Um, and, and, and ultimately we, we need to change policies instead of continuing to place this burden on community organizations, running programs, uh, on specific community members within, uh, within, within marginalized communities who are doing an incredible job right now and taking on incredible burdens um, to, to respond in, 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 in the face of government systems that don't necessarily respond to their needs currently. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I think, I think that coming back to advocating for uh, shifts to the government approach to addressing hunger, to really address the roots of poverty, um, and to create systems that acknowledge the history of racism and colonialism and capitalism and white supremacy and, and, and that commit to dismantling those systems as part of the work that they are doing. Um, I think that that is what will lead to long lasting change. And, and I think that that's the change that we hope to see one day. 
And how does FoodShare continue to provide support more and more to those living in poverty? Um, so, I, I mean, FoodShare also is really aligned with the understanding of really focusing on income-based solutions mm -hmm. to food insecurity. So um, we work to incorporate that into the programming that we set up. Um, we look at things like um, our internal structures to um, make sure that, uh, or to, to identify areas in which our internal structures may also not necessarily be aligned with our commitment to equity and, uh, and, and justice. And so kind of to, to that end, then um, because we recognize that access to stable, well-paid um, jobs with benefits and that sort of thing um, are, are, are key to, to economic stability and therefore to addressing things like food insecurity, then we work uh, on our internal systems to ensure that our, our own team is able to, rec uh, to, to reflect kind of the diversity of experience and, and, and talent in, uh, in, in, in this incredible city. So we do things like when we post a job posting, we will anonymize resumes before they are reviewed internally. Um, we um, have decided that we don't negotiate pay when hiring for people because we recognize that certain folks may feel more empowered to try to negotiate for a salary than other folks. And, and it's not fair if, 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 if you're able to negotiate for folks who simply feel in a position to ask. Um, we also look at things like who we have hiring relationships for when we post jobs. And, and um, when we post a job, we will reach out to our networks of partners, many of whom are um, black led, black serving, uh, and, and make sure that they also see that we have job postings out and, and are encouraging folks with, from, with, from within their network, specifically people of color or, or other folks who may be facing barriers to accessing um, uh, jobs or that sort of thing to 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 respond to our applications. Um, things like uh, we took a stance on defunding the police um, during uh, during during uh, recent protest activity, um, and and this is a stance that has caused us to lose donors, for example. But uh, we believe that this is. Um, another thing that's in response to the violence against Black and Indigenous people, in, in response to the killings of Black and Indigenous people by law enforcement in Canada, that would be in service of um, empowerment in, in those communities. And so we, we stand alongside Black Lives Matter and, and support the fight for Black liberation. So what is Future doing not only to support the people and communities that it serves, but to the environment in general? How does it continue to be sustainable? Um, so, so, I mean, I think we at FoodShare also recognize that food justice and climate justice from the environmental side of things, the two are interconnected and, and really cannot be pulled apart. Um, and so in, in recognizing this, then we have done things like uh, we recently revisited food shares, food justice statements, um, and are currently exploring how to more meaningfully integrate a climate justice lens into um, the work that we do. Um, similarly, uh, I think that we recognize that there is a difference and, and, and a very important difference between climate justice and traditional environmentalism. Um, many of the same problematic elements that are being recognized in the food system th the, through um, the kind of history of white led leadership and organizations are also present in the traditional environmental movement. Um, and, and we believe that the climate justice movement is a little bit different because it recognizes that the impacts of climate change are not being um, borne by everyone equally and, and that certain communities are, are being disproportionately impacted through environmental racism and that sort of thing. And so um, all of it kind of, I think, aligns insofar as, as it recognizes that the folks facing the greatest injustice, the folks who are most vulnerable to um, climate change, 
these are the folks who must be at the table and who must be empowered with decision-making power to, to determine what the solutions will be and, and to drive the solution finding process in, in both of these things. So throughout this entire interview, we've kind of been talking about how the government and food share can better support the community. I'm asking you now, how can the community and the public better support food share? Um, the, in terms of supporting food share, I mean, I guess I, I, I always like to direct folks to our website, foodshare.net, um, where you can um, donate directly. Um, these donations do things like support our emergency good food box distribution programs, but also support kind of general food share programming and, uh, and, and our work and our activism as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in your opinion, how can the public better support BLM in general? That's also a really important question. Um, uh, the, the public, I think, it's important for people to pay extremely close attention to the demands of Black-led groups and Black-led serving, or, or, and Black serving groups. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think that the, the best thing that people can do right now who are looking to support Black Lives Matter is to take their leadership and their direction from the Black community and from what they are saying from the Black community, not from what the media is reporting about the Black community, not from what white-led institutions are saying or, or coming out um, with in, 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 in response to, to, to what, what is being seen, but, but directly from Black-led groups and Black-serving groups. Um, I, I also think that things like uh, we as individuals are too often still struggling to be vocal in the spaces that we occupy. Um, and and I think I think we are still so hesitant uh, to insist that dismantling white supremacy and tackling anti-black racism is the work, um, and not another add-on or or not another uh, one. It's it's not a one-day workshop. This is the ongoing difficult work that we must all kind of sit in and sit with. That's awesome. Um, so I think those are all the topics that I want to talk with you about today. Thank you again so much for joining us and talking with us about food share and about BLM and everything. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully this, uh, this was a little bit helpful and thank you so much. Uh, I, I appreciate you also giving airtime to these ideas and, 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 and these voices. And I think that um, more groups, it's important to kind of take the pulse from, from the community. So thank you for that. Thank you. I feel like it's our job as, you know, the people who are able to broadcast um, louder voices within the community. So it's only the moral thing. Mm -hmm. And it comes with incredible power. I mean, you That's have right. a platform that you can use to elevate, to elevate whichever voices you choose to elevate. And, and that's such a powerful choice and opportunity for you folks. Um, and I think it also aligns with um, some of the um, more recent activity that Food Share has been involved in has involved organizing panels um, and, and online Zoom panels that highlight and profile voices and leaders and, and, and just kind of uh, powerful change makers within the Black community. Um, both in Canada and the United States and, and the UK and, and kind of holding up their voices as a as a lodestar, as 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 an opportunity to 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 kind of give folks something to 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 celebrate and also to take direction from, um, because we have so many incredible Black folks doing such incredible work, and and I think historically that work has just not been recognized in the way that it ought to be. I'm glad that's being that it's being recognized now. Regardless, it's still there's still a long way to go, but. At least it's a start. Agreed. And if folks are interested in hearing more about either past food share panels or upcoming panels, then I would encourage them to check out our Facebook page. Um, we recently had a panel entitled Leading While Black. Um, and earlier in the summer, there was another panel entitled Black Women on Black Food Sovereignty. Um, all really, really inspiring, exciting discussions. And uh, we're hoping to put together some more real soon. Thank you so much for all of your input, Leslie. Um, to the Regent Park community, thank you for tuning in. And as we bring more and more perspectives to 
the show. I hope that we realize not only how large this issue is, but how interconnected it all is. By aiding one problem, we are only pushing for a better society overall. So as Leslie said, if you would like to look more into Food Share and all of the ways that you can support them, you can visit them at foodshare.net. As of right now, stay tuned. There's more to come. Please do not forget to like, comment, and share to our channel. Follow us on all our social media platforms. And for more information, please check out our website.